morning. All right. Our children's church, uh, if you want your kids to go to children's church, just meet right in the back. Our children's church teachers are gathering back there. And uh, our preschool, zero to four, and then uh, five to ten years old is children's church. It's downstairs, and we have several adults there. Um, we keep a pretty good track on our kids, so uh, you will need to pick them up, parents. We don't just let anybody pick your kids up. They're downstairs and make a left if you're picking kids up and it's down that hallway in the big children's church room all right and uh, feel free to go or feel free to stay in here as well so here we are back in our study in uh, looking at our toolkit what kind of toolkit well you probably have a toolkit at your house somewhere you probably have uh, a toolkit in your garage you may have a toolkit in uh, not just your garage, but you may even have a toolkit in your car. Most of us have something in our car that we can uh, use to work on our car when it quits. Not if, by the way, when it quits. If you drive Iowa cars, it's when, it's not ever if. Amen? Amen. And so we're talking about the Christian's toolkit. And it's uh, kind of a non-tangible toolkit, isn't it? It's one of those where you carry it with you and you don't even have to know, worry about where it's at, where you left it, hunted up in the garage, or did I leave it at somebody's house, or whatever. You've got one, amen? You have a toolkit as a Christian. And it's full of resources, full of toys that will allow you to follow Jesus well. I find that after about 39 years of ministry now, I find that most of us don't even know we've got a toolkit. And uh, it's, it's invisible, but it's visible. <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, it's there for us. And we started out talking about, you know, for about eight months through the book of Ephesians, talking about the first half of that book in belief, the second half of that book in behavior, and talking a little bit through the three-pronged focus of a follower of Jesus. You know, part of the reason we have so much more trouble than we should have in life is because we're not focused on that three-prong focus, that my mission in life is to be a disciple. It's to be and make disciples. That's what the Bible says. I mean, all of us have the same mission. Amen. That's what the Bible says for every follower of Jesus. We're to be and make disciples. But then we forget we've got a purpose, and that's deeper than our mission. And the Bible is very specific about that, too. Our purpose is to glorify God. With everything we do, we're to glorify God. And then sometimes we forget that there's more than the mission. Uh, we've not just got the purpose to glorify God and the mission to be and make disciples, but we also have a life to live. And the Bible says that in our life, we're to bear fruit. And so there's that three-pronged focus of a Christian. Guarantee you, you will not have to go through any more struggle in following Jesus than Jesus allows you to go through or wants you to go through to shape you and grow you if you will focus on that three-pronged focus. My mission is to be and make disciples. Thank you, God, for that mission. That's not a mission given to an institution called the church. That is a mission given to a follower of Jesus Christ that applies to all followers of Jesus. All of us are to be, when we commit our life to Christ, and by the way, this is hard to explain to someone who is, is uh, newly placed their faith in Jesus, right? We had uh, 13 people pray to receive Christ last night, a couple of others, you know, recommitting that kind. Of, it's really hard to prepare them when you say, now you realize you're fully committing your life to follow Jesus, and they go, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I just want to go. Well, you really don't, but you will. <laughs> you will understand what that means, like all the rest of us, right? Um, I can remember early on in my career, I was taught uh, as a pastor, I was taught, you know, just tell people, uh, you just give your heart to Jesus, your life to Jesus, and everything in life will be okay. Well, that's just not true. <laughs> everything in life is not okay. Uh, in fact, things appear and surface that you weren't even conscious of, right? When you start serving Jesus and following him. But not, regardless of all of that, when we follow Jesus and to follow him well means that we are committed to be and make disciples. Being a disciple 
that's where people are investing in us and we're growing in our faith and we're living life well with Jesus on a daily basis. Making disciples is us getting to the point where we're investing in others, not just being invested in. Amen, church? Amen. And we're helping people be a disciple. And you heard me say many for many weeks, if you're a guest here today, uh, this is not new <laughs> to our folks. Uh, first of all, church is not your life. Jesus is your life. Church is not. And church does not equal biblical community. So be wary of any Bible church, evangelical church that tries to get you to think that the only life you have is at a campus on a Sunday morning having church. That's not a being model of following Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. We're having church this morning, and I love it. I love to have church. And it's part of biblical community, but it does not equate to biblical community. Having coffee with a brother or sister in the Lord is biblical community. Uh, getting involved in a small group, and we have a lot of those opportunities that we'll be sharing uh, next week um, for you to involve yourself in biblical community. And by the way, biblical community we see in the scripture is not only limited to a local place that we call a local church or local gathering of people that follow Jesus. There are ways to be involved in the biblical community that God has spread all over the world. We call that missions. <laughs> we call that cooperating, collaborating with the kingdom of God and how we do that to move it forward. So biblical community is this big thing. And we've been talking about making, being and making disciples and how our life, everything we do should glorify God. That's our deeper purpose. And I wish I could say I glorify God every day, every moment, but I don't. And neither do you. Amen. <laughs> Because none of us are perfect at glorifying God. But there are tons of ways that we do glorify God. And that is our deeper purpose. When we become followers of Jesus, get on this disciple's journey, we're called and committed to be a disciple. And that means that we have to do our due diligence and God changes us from the inside out. Transformation uh, and conforming to his image, not conform to the world, all that kinds of stuff. But the truth is you and I have some due diligence in that process of moving from once we're moved, we've moved from no birth to new birth, we have some due diligence. It, it's called obedience. It's called, it's called growing. It's called learning. It's called being familiar with God's word. It's called being you know, in biblical community so that we can get support and encouragement and help and collaboration to move the kingdom of God forward. I don't know what I would do without biblical community. No one's an island to themselves in the kingdom of God. When we become an island to ourselves, the water overtakes the island and we sink. Amen? That's what happens. And so we've been spending a lot of time talking about that three-pronged focus. So when we're focusing on our mission to be and make disciples, our deeper purpose to glorify God, and my life to bear fruit. In fact, John 15 says, much fruit. That's the uh, qualifier. That's the, you know, the KPI, that key uh, predictive indicator, you know. We call it the kingdom, the KPI, is that we want to get to the point where we're bearing much fruit for the Lord, right? right. And, and then uh, what we need is to recognize the toolkit that God has given us for help. And we all know faith and spiritual disciplines and prayer. We all know those. But we're investigating deeper into the toolkit. And um, for uh, a couple of weeks, we've been talking about the, the first tool in the Christian's toolkit. Go ahead, hit that slide, Jared. And we've been talking, uh, and we started with the Bible. We didn't spend much time there because we're going to end this series probably 10 to 12 tools. Yeah, it's going to be a while. Um, and uh, we're going to end this series with the Bible. So the Bible is the bookends for our toolkit, right? It's what carries all the tools. It's the, I don't want to say the Bible's a bag, but, but visually it's the bag that carries all the tools, right? It's, the, it's the, uh, the front and the end, and all of our tools are wrapped up in the Word of God. Amen. And so, so uh, we looked at that, and we're going to end with that. So I'll go to that next slide, because what we said was there's a tool in your tool kit that you may not know is in there that you struggle with. Every day, probably. And it's called embracing change. <laughs> it's called embracing change. Embracing change is not easy. And um, we 
we moved from Ephesians to Deuteronomy. We kind of summarized what happened in Deuteronomy, 40 years in the wilderness wanderings. Moses leading God's people out of Israel to the promised land should have been, if you look it up, it says 11 days. It's probably more realistic to be about 14 days. And instead of 14 days out of Egypt to the Jordan River to go into God's best, remember, the promised land, anytime you read it in the Bible, what's it mean? It means God's best. And it, God's best is never without challenges and giants. We know that from Canaan and the promised land. Because you got to battle for God's best. And all of a sudden you see 40 years of God teaching people to trust Him. Listen, I, 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 uh, I can remember preaching years ago when you had to wear suits all the time. I hate suits, man. I, I'm not a suit guy. I can remember wearing suits for years. I remember I was preaching in a large church. I was leading a convention of churches in another state. And I was in Missouri, the show me state, right? I was in Missouri and... Uh, and this, uh, this church, the balcony, and all this stuff. And, and I preached, and, um, and I got done, and I went over, and I saw, you know, you kind of stick around in those kind of churches for people to come and, and tell you how much they love the sermon and all that stuff, and you're just in your head, you're going, oh, man. You didn't, you didn't really get anything I was talking about. I was talking about Jesus, man. <laughs> if you want to come down and tell me, man, I'm closer to Jesus, I'm going to take that as a compliment. But don't come down and tell me, well, it's a great sermon you preach, Pastor. Because that's just, you know, please don't do that to pastors. Because pastors, when they're shaking their head, a good pastor, when he's shaking his head, going, thank you, thank you. And you say, that's a good sermon, Pastor. And, and maybe it's just semantics. Maybe we know what you mean. But when you say that, a good pastor just is thinking in his head, oh, God, they just heard me, didn't they? They didn't hear you. They, they just heard me, what I said. They really didn't hear what you said through your word. Uh, so so be, be careful of that, all right? Amen? Now, some of you are going, oh my gosh, I've said that many times, pastors. Well, <laughs> when, we, when we hear God's word, we don't want to hear from a pastor. We want to hear from the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. He's our teacher. Some man's not our teacher. The Spirit of God is our teacher when we open up the Bible and the word of God. I'm not your teacher this morning. I'm just facilitating this discussion we're having around the Word of God. The Spirit of God doesn't say something to you and all you hear is some developmental principles from me. It doesn't do you much good when you go out of this place. You won't be conformed to the image of Jesus. You won't transform. You'll continue to be conformed to the world. If you go to the church and you only hear from a man and you never hear from the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. That's just the way it is. And I remember this Man, in his 80s, I was probably in my 50s then, early. I'm sorry, I was in my 20s. I'm in my 30s now. And so he, I saw him, he's walking down. And he's walking like this. Kind of like I do. I'm getting older. He's doing this. It took him a while, you know. He must have had that counting steps on his app, right? He's, he's get, that's what Lisa and I do. She gets, she gets more steps than me. Every day. And I'm like, how do you do that? Well, her steps are like this. Her, you know. Mine are like a mine are like, yeah. You know what? So I'm like, baby, it's no wonder you get more steps than me, right? What's the boy? He's just doing this down the aisle. I saw him. I'm fidgeting with my Bible and my bag over there. And I'm thinking, oh, man. Oh, this guy's coming to let me have it. I can tell. He's in his 80s, and he's probably letting me. He comes down, he looks up at me, and he puts his, his paws right up here on my shoulders. <laughs> like he's, you know, puppy getting up here on you. And, and I'm like, whoo, man, brush your teeth, brother. <laughs> you know, he's that close. He's in my personal space. And well, it's this, not here, but this. And, and I said, can I help you, sir? <laughs> he's already got a hold of me. He's not letting go. And he says, uh, he says I've been in this church for... 70, 80 years. I thought, oh, here it comes. He's just going to let me have it, man. He's going to let me have it. And he said, I was in this church in my mama's womb before I was even born. And he went on about how he'd been in that church his whole life, even before he had life in his mama's womb and all that. And I'm like, oh, boy, he's really building up to something bad. And, uh, and I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I wanted to take his paws off and just put it by it, but I couldn't, I couldn't do that. So he kept talking. He said, 
And I heard what you said today preaching. He said, I thought I'd come down here at the invitation time, but I just knew I couldn't get down here in time. And I went, yes, sir. And, and here's what he said. He said, I've been the guy in this church my whole life. Everything new that came up, I said no. I've been the guy in this church, Pastor. By the way, it was a large First Baptist church. He said, I've, you know, they, they have business meetings every month, all that stuff. He said, I, uh, I, I've been in this church uh, so long, and every time we had a new pastor or something new about reaching people would come up, I was always the guy that said no. I was always the guy that challenged everything that people in our church wanted to do that I wasn't familiar with that was changed. And now he's tearing up. I'm tearing up. Because now I know this is not about him coming up to me and lambasking me, right? All of a sudden I realize this is God's got a hold of this old man's heart. Finally. Finally, after all these years in his wilderness wanderings, more than 40 years of his wilderness wanderings, God had gotten a hold of it. And so I just relaxed. I said, sir, I'm, I'm sorry. I said, I'm sorry. He said, I am too, young fellow. He said, because today God told me that I'm that man that never wanted anything in my church to change. I never wanted anything in my life to change. I never wanted anything in my family to change. But I came to church every Sunday and sat on all these committees and we talked about how God wants to transform us and how God wants to conform us into His image and I never got it until today. Until today, I never got it. And I said, sir, all I can say is, I'm glad you got it today. I'm glad you got it today. Let me tell you what you don't want to be. You don't want to be that follower of Jesus that when you get old like that old man, you've spent 40 or 50 years wandering in the wilderness of life, challenging every opportunity that God gives you because it's new or because you don't get it or you don't understand it or you misread it in Scripture. Amen? I mean, we, we had a magician here last night. Let me just head off some of those emails this morning. All right? Uh, when the Bible talks about magic, it is a completely different kind of magic than what we saw last night with illusions. Amen? <laughs> completely different. So if you're going to come to me and challenge me about magic, you better read your Bible, you better get your logos out, and another study book or two, and find out what the Bible's really saying. Because last night is something that you and I live in every single day, only we don't hear about Jesus in the midst of it, like we did last night. So, 40 years in the wilderness wanderings. When it should have taken 11 to 14 days to trust God when you get uncomfortable with God being at work in your life and trying to move you across the River Jordan or whatever barrier it is in your life to His best. And for some of us, we've never been in His best. Amen? I'm just telling you, lots and lots of Christians have never experienced God's best one day because all they can do is live in today. They can't live in tomorrow yet. What I mean by that? Well, our church family knows what I mean by that. If you keep today in your present, you keep not heading toward God's best, you will never, in fact, in the, in the future you, you will be the present you. Did you get that? Picture that. I don't mean you'll be the same age. <laughs> I mean you'll be older at the same stage. You don't want to be at the same stage tomorrow. You want to be farther along with Jesus. You're not even going to be at the same age anyway. There are things we don't have control over that change. And we embrace those because we have to. 
But God's not a God who makes us embrace change. It's beautiful, the thing He's given us, this thing we call choice. It's amazing. You know, I used to think that love was the greatest thing God gave us. I mean, faith, hope, and love. Love is the greatest, 1 Corinthians 13, and I, I believe that. But the more I studied the Scripture over the years, the more I realized the greatest thing God ever gave me was my own choice. Choose Jesus, not choose Him. Choose to grow, not grow. Choose to embrace change in my toolkit, get it out and go, hey, I'm just going to trust you on this, Lord. I don't really like it, but I'm going to trust you on it. <laughs> I don't know about that. A job change, you keep putting godly counsel, you, you keep opening up opportunities, you, you keep doing all these things that make me think about a job. Uh, uh, I'm going to stay right. Did you know the average person today, it's changed. The average person today will experience six to eight career changes. Do you know that? That's the data today. Isn't that crazy? Because when I grew up, you know, a few years ago, with my parents, you worked one job your whole life. You probably never left the state. <laughs> you know, probably never went on vacation. Any of that kinds of stuff. By the way, I prayed for a pony and he gave me a horse, just so you know. <laughs> I was a kid. No, I didn't pray, but he gave me a horse anyway. Um, so... Embracing change, I can't tell you how important it is to trust God in the midst of change. And when you get old like me and start getting older, you learn to trust God in the midst of change a little quicker than you do when you're younger. Amen? Us old people? Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I'll get an amen if I go us more mature people. Amen. All right. Yeah. All right. So um, let me read this to you. We're going to... We've already looked at the first two. I'll just go over them real quickly and we'll look at the last two, or at least the third one today. We'll see Joshua chapter 1. So we saw in Deuteronomy um, the three sermons that Moses preached. And um, chapter 31 through 34 is the trend, not only his three sermons, but also the transition from Moses to Joshua. And, uh, and he was prepping them. So Moses was a prepper. He was prepping them to go over the Jordan River. Um, he knew he could not go over into the promised land. God's best was over for him. He, he did get God's best, but it was a different level, a different time. And, and he's prepping the people to go over the Jordan River. He's prepping them for the challenges and how to battle for God's best. That's what he's prepping them for, how to battle for God's best. Because you don't get God's best without a battle. You don't get God's best without some self-sacrifice. You don't get God's best without some, some battling powers and principalities. You don't get God's best without refuting a world system that is, is now pressuring all of us in this country, especially Christians, to do what the world system says to do. You, you don't get God's best living in a carnal body, the world, the flesh. You don't get God's best without without mastering control of this carnality and minimizing the temptation that turns into sin. You don't get God's best without battling the world, the flesh, and the devil. You'll never get God's best if you're not willing to battle for it. You'll always be, Romans 12, 1 and 2, conformed to the world, not transformed uh, to Christ. And, and so many Christians today just continue to be conformed to the world because they give in to the world system, they give in to the flesh, and the devil has access at major points in their life every single day. So you've got to battle for it. So I'm, I, know, I'm getting, I know what some of you say. Hey, you preached that two weeks ago. I know, but I'm just reminding you. You've got to battle for God's best. And, and, and it gets tiring. But don't, don't worry, he'll energize you. But you got to reach in the toolkit. you got to get in the toolkit. you got to dig a little deeper than prayer. I know that sounds crazy, deeper than prayer. Listen, there are tools in your toolkit. You, don't, you, haven't, you haven't taken a price tag off of them, let alone used them. And embracing change without being forced to is probably one of those for most Christians. And, and, and here's what he says. After the death of Moses, servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Next slide, Jared. So what's that mean? What's that mean? Moses, my servant, is dead. 
That next slide. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we, we looked at what that means. It means that God is at work moving us forward. It means that we've got a past me, and I've got a present me, but God is moving me into the future me. And in the future me and the present me, there needs to be some metrics that God measures by where he says, hey, Jim, in the present you and the future you, I want to see transformation happen. I want to see you being more conformed to the image of my son happen. I want to see you bearing fruit. I want to see you glorifying me more, better. I want to, I want to see you being, being a disciple. I want to see you uh, making disciples from the present you to the future you, Jim. There, you ought to not just follow me well. You ought to follow me better. Amen. Better. Amen. So, Jim... You, you need to know that in the present you, you don't need to be, I mean, in the future you, you don't need to be the present you. But in the present you, you got to work. you got to battle. you you got to believe. you you got to dig deep in your toolkit and be more conformed to my image in order to be who I want you to be in the future you. You may very well be who God wants you to be in the present you right now. But you're not going to be who God wants you to be without focusing on being and making disciples and glorifying God and bearing fruit in your life. Amen? You got that this morning? And, and so, so he says, uh, hey, I'm working on that. Moses dead. But that's not the end. We're not going, okay, Moses dead. We all got to go back to Egypt. No, that's not what he's saying at all. By the way, a lot of them would have just said, okay. Because they were tired of man. They were tired of quail. Right? They were tired of the same food all the time. But they weren't tired of it when they asked for it. They were hungry. Isn't that crazy how we do that? We ask God for something. He gives us more than what we ask for. And then we get tired. And then we want more. Well, we, we call that giving into the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's what we call that. And, and, and uh, God is saying, no, Moses is dead. And what that means is, that I'm still here and I'm at work moving you forward across the Jordan River into a place you have never been before and you're going to have to battle for my best. That's what my best looks like. And so when it says here that, that Joshua, the son of Moses, this is saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, go and arise to Jordan. Well, he says that he spoke to Joshua, right? So if you and I are going to be in the present us, better for Jesus in the future us, God is speaking and we've got to position ourselves to hear from God. So one of the things you've got to do is think about how do I position myself to hear from God? It's got to be more than a having model church on Sunday. Amen. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be taking advantage of the full biblical community at your disposal. Certainly having church on Sunday morning, doing church, being church, right? We're not in a having, doing, being model. We're in a being church, doing church, having church model. And guess what? When you're doing things like engaging the community that we did in back to school bash last night, when you, if you were part of that and you came to church today, you're tired, but I'll guarantee you, you're celebrating church in a different way today. Amen? You're too tired. <laughs> okay. But, but that's just the way it is. When, when you're not being and doing, when you're not being who you need to be through the week following Jesus, and you're not doing, you're not serving Him, then when you come to church on Sunday, all you can think about is being fed because you're hungry. And, and then when something's said, when you're not being and doing and you're only having, that's why we have so much conflict in church and so many milky Christians. is because... When something's said you don't like, you don't agree with, you don't check it out with the Word of God. You check it out with your opinion and your experience, and then you don't like it, and then you leave church. People leave church, and they go, man, I don't know what's going on there. That place, I, you know, but yeah, well, I've heard them all in 39 years, I can assure you that. And I've led three large organizations, and I, so I've heard my share of it plus 20 other pastor lifetimes. I mean, I've heard all those grumblings. And it's, and it, and it's really about... Because people have never experienced being and doing and then having. When you experience being and doing for Jesus, when you come together, it's celebratory. It's joyful. 
It's fulfilling. It's energizing when you worship the Lord when you're being who He wants you to be on a day-to-day basis. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, it's a new day. New opportunities. That's what He's saying. Moses is dead. New day. New opportunities for you. You're going to have to battle for it, but we'll talk about that later. Don't want to scare you right now. <laughs> Amen? I'll t- we'll talk about that. i got a game plan for you. Next one. So, last week we talked about this one. What is Moses... Is dead me. Well, it means that that if we're going to continue to follow, listen. By the way, if you're following Moses, you're following the wrong person. Yeah. If you go to church for a pastor, you're following the wrong person. You go to church for your friends, you're following the wrong person. You go to church because your family attends there, you're you're following the wrong person. You go to a church because God led you there, not because somebody's there, but because He's there, and He has a place for you there. He wants to. Integrate you into the body life, into a biblical community. And having church on Sunday is part of that. And, 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 uh, and so when Moses is dead, by the way, I hear Moses is dead a lot in my, in my head. The Lord tells me Moses is dead a lot. Just to keep me on track with him. And, and not putting all my confidence in something or someone else other than him. Sometimes I think God kills things and then says, hey, that's dead. <laughs> I go, yeah, because you killed it. <laughs> you know? um, he does that because it means that, that following Jesus requires change in our life. It just does. When I was a 23-year-old alcoholic biker, my bike's parked outside. I rode it today. I hardly ever get to ride it. Right? When I was a 23-year-old alcoholic biker, I had to get rid of every friend I had. Well, except Lisa. And I tried to do that until I got saved. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, I'd get rid of everybody. They were all bad for me. And some of you know what I'm talking about. I, I had to start working on my, on my behavior and, and on my belief because, because my belief shaped my behavior. And so I didn't, you know, it took me a long time to learn the Word of God. And I was in ministry two years after I was saved. I still didn't know the Word of God. I was still depending on what I knew, what my experience was, and what my opinion was. You know how damaging that can be to your future? Listen, at some point, you've got to get to the right of milk and understand that what's important for my personal growth in the Lord and following Him well is not what I believe. It is not my opinion. It has nothing to do with my experience. Not that those three things are not important, But they're not the priority. The priority is what does God say about it. So at some point in your house, at your job, with your friends, in our church, and in your head, you've got to shift from, well, I think we ought to. Well, my opinion is. Well, you know, my experience, we. And you've got to shift away from that me stuff. And you've got to shift to the I, the I am. You got to shift. Okay, God, what do you say? Okay, God, what do you want? This is part of how you position yourself to hear from God. Is you begin to get away from the self-centeredness that we have, that habit of self-centeredness all the time that the world, flesh, and the devil has has taught us. That's its curriculum. You know that, right? The world, flesh, and the devil, they have their own school. In session 24-7, and you are enrolled in. And, and their main curriculum is self-centeredness. This says, whatever I want to do, I do. Whatever I think is okay is okay for me if it's not okay for you. No! I'll tell you who determines if it's okay for me. It's God that determines that. And I position myself to hear from Him by reading His Word. By getting confirmation by the Spirit who lives in me at the temple of the Holy Spirit. By getting godly counsel from people who invest in me, care about me, and love me. And walk with God, not my knothead friends, but my but my spiritual friends. We all got knothead friends, bunches of them. And then we got a few spiritual friends. Those are the ones we get godly counsel from. Not our knothead friends. Man, I used to listen to my knothead friends. They got me in more trouble. Than, yeah, well, just go thump it. <laughs> yeah, that's good advice. I'm just going to go thump it. No, that's not what God wants. And, and all of a sudden, you, you begin to understand that following Jesus requires change. So, 
How can I transition through the loss of change? We talked about this last week, and I had a few questions <clears throat> asked after church about loss and grief. All change brings some loss. I'm not a counselor, but I am a coach. I've been coaching for 18 years, executive leaders, business people, people in ministry. And I can tell you the main thing that I coach people about, especially executive leaders, is, is loss. Because change happens in organizational life. Change happens in families. Change happens in communities. Change happens everywhere. The real bumper sticker we need to have is change happens. Not the other. Amen. <laughs> change happens. Because that's true. And so embracing change is essential for God's best. You're never going to get God's best until you trust him enough to embrace God-led change in your life. And if you don't, you're going to miss out on opportunities and possibilities. Next slide. Now, we're going to get in one for today. <laughs> okay. Moses is dead. What's that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means that you're probably not going to be able to depend on yesterday's solutions for today's challenges in your life. Moses is dead. You know, that's part of, I, I, I mean, I've been around church, Alan, like you and Miriam have, Pastor Alan, Miriam, 34 years of church God. Amazing people right there. And uh, I've, been, I've been there a long time with you, and I'm just telling you, Church is about behind about 20 years, isn't it? I used to say 10, but it's at least 20 years. And then you, you combine that with Alaska being behind about 10 years. <laughs> you know, you got a whole lifetime of being behind. The one, the one thing that just drives me crazy about church, especially when I'm talking to pastors about their churches and consulting with other churches, especially small churches, small churches like ours, is that they keep depending on yesterday's solutions for today's challenge. Over and over and over. Listen, yesterday, stuff that worked yesterday, the world left behind because the world changes. And if you keep trying to do what you did yesterday to meet the demands in your life for today, it's not going to work. Oh, there are a few things that work. I get that. You can't even parent kids today like you used to. You get locked up. We didn't play with the switch. We got beat with one. Amen. I mean, things have really changed. <laughs> you know? Things have really changed. I asked a couple of our youth not long ago about their switch, and they had no clue what I was talking about when I said I had a switch when I was a kid. They didn't laugh at all. They didn't get it. They have no clue what that. I said, yeah, I used to go pick switches off the tree. They go, what? They grow on trees? I'm like, not the switch you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are so many things we cannot repeat from yesterday to meet the demands and challenges of life today. Amen. So many. And church is that way. Right. I can tell you, we're not going to get past this one because I've got to talk to you about biblical relevancy and cultural sensitivity. Because this, this is so important for you in your life. As you, as you are on mission as a Christian, and you will be on mission at a greater depth and level and impact as you grow in your faith from no birth to new birth, to milk, to meat, to maturity, that disciple's journey that you're on. You may, you may totally get this, you may not, but I can assure you, I, I can remember the first half of my ministry in 30, almost 40 years now where I bought into the lie, uh, this, a lie because it doesn't match up with Scripture, um, that we're to be culturally relevant. I used to say that. I used to teach that to pastors all over the country. Uh, relevancy. What's that mean? Well, cultural relevancy. We need to keep up with the culture. Well, the truth is that's wrong. One day, God really convicted me about that. Um, and what we're supposed to do in order, rather than depending on yesterday's solutions for today's challenges in our life, in our family, except church, etc., is that, that we're supposed to be biblically relevant. Amen. Listen to a good example of that. 
yesterday, uh, back school bash. Biblically relevant means that everybody in this world needs Jesus. That's biblical relevance. And they don't have an opportunity to invite him to be their Savior and Lord without hearing the gospel. I can't tell you over the years how many people have said to me, Pastor, I don't need to, I don't need to, to, to share the gospel. I live it out. I'm like, well, praise the Lord. You must be at milk. They go, what, 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 what? Milk? I got a mustache? I, I, I ate cereal this morning. No, I'm not talking about that. They don't even know what milk means. No, I mean spiritual milk. They go, what, what are you talking about? I've been in church for 50. Listen, I don't care how long you've been in church. That doesn't equate to your spiritual growth where you are on the chart of no birth, new birth, milk, meat, and maturity. That's the, that's the disciples' journey. You can be in church your whole life like that 80-something-year-old man and be to the left of milk. <laughs> I've had so many people say to me, Pastor, I just live for Jesus and I'm modeling and people know. I, no, they don't know. I didn't know. I never heard the gospel. I was 23 before I heard the gospel. Nobody at my house told me. I wasn't raised at that kind of a home. 11 kids? Who's got time for the gospel? I'm number 10. My brother, you know, Chef Lindell, brother Scout, he's number 11. He's the youngest, and we're all old now, right? I mean, I was 23. I never heard the gospel. I've seen lots of people live it out, but I had no clue. I just thought they were goody two shoe people. I didn't know they were Christians because nobody told me. Nobody shared the gospel with me until my wife made me go to church one day and I heard it. I was an iron worker and there was a pipe fitter pastor by vocational. I thought, this can't be a bad place. She goes, church, I'm, well, what's that? Do I buy you something when we get there? I mean, I was totally ignorant. Right? <laughs> Biblical relevancy means that yes, of course, we model with our living what it looks like to follow Jesus. Of course. But I can assure you, people who have never, you think people, you think everybody's heard the gospel? No. I meet people all the time who have never heard the gospel. All the time. I get tired of getting off. That's part of why I don't want to fly anymore. You know, I'm like, God, really? I mean, three and a half hours to Seattle. Another four hours somewhere else, and I'm, I've got to talk the whole time to two different people. That's a All good right? thing. That's a good thing. It is a good thing, but I'm like, is there somebody else on the plane can, can do this once in a while? No. My goodness. It's crazy. <laughs> Biblical relevance is that we follow Jesus. People notice it. And occasionally, people who grew up in church and left without faith or left their faith or whatever, they'll, they'll notice it. But you'll be surprised how many people will just think you're a goody two-shoe. Yeah. They, won't, they won't know the difference. you got to learn to share the gospel. Good. you got to learn to share the gospel. So important. you got to learn to speak up for Jesus. That's right. our, our, some of our youth are in here today. Good to have some of them back. And, and one thing we started doing before the summer schedule was Teaching our youth how to share their story in three minutes with a gospel invitation. And we're going to pick up, back up on that. We have some new leadership coming in to our youth. That's something we're going to offer to our adults as well. All of us need to know how to share our story. I led a couple people to Christ when I asked them, I said, hey, um, you know where this all started? It started with Jesus. And uh, when I invited him to be my personal Savior and Lord, and you know what? You can too, and I'd call their name, you can too, Right now, would you like to do that? I, I, I know two teenagers that I talked to last night said, uh, the one first one, she said, well, I, I, I think I've done that. <laughs> kind of like it's a, a checked box on a list, right? And I didn't say that to her, but that's what I'm thinking. Oh, I've heard this before. This is it. Oh, I've checked that box already, Pastor Jim. I'm okay. And she kind of said, I think I've done that. I said, well, really? Tell me when. Well, I'm not sure, but I think I did that. I'm like, well, so you're not sure? No. I, well, I mean, I, I think I did, but I'm not sure. So you're not sure? Well, I, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. I said, would you like to be sure? Hmm. I guess I would like to be sure. Okay. 
You'd like to be sure? You want to be sure right now? You want to invite Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior and Lord? You got to get rid of that fear. You got to get rid of that embarrassment that the devil puts in your head. You got to step out for Jesus. And I, I get it. I've been doing this a long time. I know it's new for most people in the church. I, I totally get that. But at some point, you've got to start being biblically relevant. Amen. And the place you start is saying, God, you use me however you want. However you want. See, it's not, it's not culturally relevant. Because there are, there are a lot of things you got to do to be culturally relevant that go against what God's Word says. But just as important as being biblically relevant, right, you do have to be culturally sensitive. You do have, and you, you're going to have a hard time being culturally sensitive because the culture changes so rapidly. And now we're in a period of time in our country where subsets of culture, you know, culture is just normalized belief and behavior. That's all culture is. And we had these subsets of, of culture um, in the mainstream culture of belief and behavior for a couple of generations, and we've had those, but now we've got the subsets of culture that have become the culture. We have a perverse spirit over our whole country. We have all kinds of things coming out of that. And now we, what we see is, is that being culturally sensitive means that we have to love people we used to talk about. Let me say that again. Good. We have to love people we used to talk about. Because you're not going to get anywhere in, in, with people who believe and buy into a woke culture and... And all the other stuff, I know we've got some younger folks in here, but you know all these things that we're talking about, you're not going to get anywhere just bashing them. We don't have to agree with people to care about them. Because that's part of being biblically relevant. Just because it goes against my grain, I don't go, I don't like them. No. <laughs> if I'm biblically relevant, I'm going to love people. Whoever God puts in my path. I'm going to care for people. And for some of us, me included, that's a stretch. Yeah. Yeah. That is a stretch for me. Mm -hmm. To embrace that kind of a change. Mm -hmm. When people are so different these days, sometimes you can't tell, is that a boy or a girl? That's, that's huge. A guy who's 64 that grew up in a completely different era and generation, man, that really cuts against my grain. Yeah. And, and, and the... <laughs> The flesh in me wants to just like, what the is going on with you, man? <laughs> but the Jesus in me says, they need somebody to love them. Something's been missing a long time there. Something's been missing a long time there. Don't you dare do that. You will just show them they are right about these Christian people. You will just confirm to them and they will dig their heels in even harder. I'm just telling you, there's a whole lost and dying world of people today that are way different than they were a generation ago. And if we're going to reach them, we're going to have to care. We're going to have to love them. We don't have to agree with them. I, I find that people in that other world that I talk to occasionally, God lets me do that occasionally, that... You know, I'm not talking about the extreme ones, the squeaky wheel that gets some grease. I'm talking about other folks. They, they, don't, they don't get mad at me because I don't agree with them. In fact, they appreciate an open, honest dialogue of disagreement. But what they don't want is somebody my age telling them about how to solve their issue today by my yesterday solution. Not going to work. Not going to work. And that's true. We're going to close here. But that's true of getting. Moses is dead. He's dead. And every place the sole of your foot touches when you cross the Jordan River, something brand new for you. Every place that the sole of your foot touches, I'm going to give it to you. 
Because I, I mean, I already promised this to Moses. It goes way back to Abraham. I've already made this promise. I'm the original promise keeper. When part of what God's best looks like is, I'm going to expand your territory. I'm going to give you good things you've never had before. I'm going to let you taste things that you've never tasted before. A land of milk and honey. I'm going to teach you how to battle to keep it. I'm going, to, I'm going to teach you how to walk in victory that is already yours. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago. But you you got to leave this behind over here. Except for, for one tribe over here, the rest of you are moving on. And you got to focus on what's in front of you and stop focusing on what's behind you. That's good. Let's pray. Lord, uh, we love you, and uh, deep in our toolbox, we know, is a tool called embracing change. Lord, it's not like one or two of us struggle with that. We all do. Every person on the planet struggles with change. We experience a loss from that change, and sometimes we move into grief because we get stuck with that loss. And we can't justify why you would want us to do anything different than what we've already done. Lord, that's why the church is so behind the times today. Help us to get past, depending on yesterday's solutions, for today's challenges of walking well with you and serving you. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to make sure that we're... We're getting regular checkups with you about our loss as we walk through embracing change day by day by day. And Lord, those big changes that happen in our life and relationships and careers and work and service and church and cities and moving and all those big things that create major change. Lord, when we shift from that loss into grief, we pray we would not get stuck there. Lord, we don't want to live there for 40 years. And you teaching us how to trust you when you're at work in us, waiting to work through us. And all we're doing is focusing on what is happening to us and looking at what's going on around us. And we don't have time for what you're doing in us and how you want to work through us. God, God change that in us help us individually help our church help our community to flourish as we trust you in God led change in Jesus name we pray I want you to look up here and I want you to know for some of you here today God is doing a major work of change in your life you just received Jesus some of you but here's the invitation for some of you who have not received Jesus. What a big change that is. Big change. What a great change that is. Let me just ask you. Have you ever invited Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior and make Him the boss, the Lord of your life? Well, you know, God does love you. And He does love you just like you are. There's no doubt about that. That's what Scripture teaches but it also teaches that He loves you too much to let you stay the way you are in a lost condition. Yes, I know it's hard to hear a lost condition. I mean, after all, the Bible does teach us that Jesus Christ died on the cross. He sacrificed Himself. His blood makes atonement for our sins. Our sins, every person's sins in the whole world are forgiven because of the gift of grace of Him dying on the cross and His sacrifice for us. But like every gift, you have to receive it. And if you don't receive that gift and it is left there under the tree of your life, unopened, in your future, you will not go be with God for eternity. You just won't. What a shame, because He's already died for your sins. He already bled. His blood's already atoned for the sins of mankind. But He's been pursuing you for a personal relationship. 
And all you have to do is receive that gift. All you need to do this morning is say, Jesus, I invite you. I know, God, you love me. Jesus, I invite you to be my personal Savior, the Lord of my life. And I know that means that I am committing my life to follow you. Forgive me of my sin, all of it. Thank you. Thank you, God, for doing that. Help me to follow you to the best of my ability and with your help. Are you ready to do that this morning if you haven't done that? I know most of us in here have done that. But I just can't leave here in good conscience if you haven't without giving you an opportunity for God's best in your life. Would you bow your heads one more time before we leave today? Just lift your hand. Pastor, yes, I want to pray and invite Jesus Christ into my life to be my personal Savior and the Lord, the boss of my life. I know that means that I am committing my life to follow Him. I can't imagine how difficult that's going to be for me. But I know you're saying that He will help me. He will do it from the inside out. And I want that. I want His plan in my life. If you just lift your hand, I'm not going to embarrass you and ask you to come down in front of a congregation of people. Just I want to pray with you where you're at. Anybody this morning? Pastor, I want to invite Jesus to be my personal Savior and Lord. Anybody this morning? Yes, sir. 